talking about reactive unit blocks. Reactive yeah. blocks. Um, in our past discussion, we had talked about um, how the uh, in our past discussion we talked about how I think chapter thirteen or so we talked about why reactivity and how how it's it works and okay and how it works. But this time around, we'll be going in depth. Um, we'll be talking more about um. We we'll spend we'll more time now on observers and outputs. Um, we would also um, get to learn more about to um, we'll learn other tools for controlling the reactive graph um, isolation and timed um, invalidation. And, um, the discussion actually is would have been would have been very very because when I checked all past course videos, they had um, sort of um, um, they had a use case to to support us most of their points, and this really um, facilitated their discussion. So um, I hope that we will be able to have the, the same um, discussion today, because uh, the point was, uh, since I actually had posted the invalid invalidation part, it was looking just like more of a theoretical and um, trying to wrap my head around how it really apply in the practical, um, in the practical sense in the shiny app was looking a bit um, not so clear, but Let's just see what this looks like. So first thing first, we'll be talking about reactive values. Um, in chapter 13, we talked about why reactivity in the first place. Uh, we talked about the fact that there are functions. Uh, functions will actually do the task because they, every time they have to recompute. Then we also talked about um, having to use variables. And we said variables will not really do the, the work because um, it's time we need to um, each time we need to, each time we make a change, it will not affect um, other dependencies or other um, other um, related um, objects. It will just um, it will be stuck. It won't like put them around. We have um, two types of reactive values which we'll be talking about: the single reactive value created by reactive val and a list of reactive values created by reactive values. And um, both have slightly different interface for getting and setting values. Um, let me open my mastery tiny. Let me see my um, R Studio, the R interface. No, it's still the browser. Okay, I would think I have to stop there. Okay, I believe you should be able to see it now. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, great. So um let me see if I can minimize the screen and have the side side so that we can yes, see how this code works together. Okay, so uh actually we have um we have reactive valve. And how exactly does this work? Um, the active val actually works more like a um, when it's going to get value. It's work like a like a when you want to get a value. It works like a, a a zero a zero argument function. But when you're about to set the value, it works like a one argument function. And I think we talked about this when we we're talking chapter thirteen. But for reactive values, like I said earlier, you use a list. So how exactly do you set and get you? Um, let's run this and see what happens. So if we have a reactive value and we have set it to be 10, um, when we never call that back, we get 10. And if we want to, um, if we want to, if we want to get to the value, we just um, call use x and we do that and we get the value. But then if we want to set it, we just have to impute the value and get a, we get this new value set for this object. As of reactive values, this time around, we have to actually name each of the objects in the in the function. Reactive values as equals ten. Then we put the bracket and say e equals equals two. And from there, we can, we are able to like get other reactive values. And we can also use reactive val in the list form. But this time around, we have to use a list function and say okay, a equals reactive val one and b equals reactive val val two. And we can reference make reference to reactive values using these. Um, 
the symbol dollar symbol um and we'll be able to get um the the um the object based on um the object based on your pet name okay so i think this is that i think also also mentioned the fact that in the book actually use reactive values but personally when you write you use reactive value. uh so at like you said you said you think square something because it's the same basic square that's something you already been on okay so um let's move forward i already mentioned about it already why we can't use um um variables because when we are trying to it doesn't whenever we modify or do anything we don't get what we have we don't get we don't get to see the change anymore it's it's stuck somewhere we just get to see like this is a1 um a2 all assigned to the 10 but when we make a2 and a2 20 a1 doesn't change um a1 remains then but for reactive values this is not the case whenever i change it happens to b2 it will not affect b1 so this exercise so this exercise um, what are the difference between the two lists of reactive values and compare the same for getting a certain reactive um, value? Uh, I think uh, I did a bit of this here. And um, that is it. So, L1 is, react is the list form for the reactive value function. And we have A equals to 1 and A equals to 2. And for L2, this time around, we have to consciously bring the list function into play because reactive value will only take in. We only work with just one at a time. So, but we can reference. Um, we can see reference for each of the objects in the list. So, for L one, we will make a reference and say A. Um, a um, let's do that and see what happens. L one. We would then get this to be one. And if we need to set it, we just have to um, bring the bracket in and put it there, and we set something new. Same thing also for L2, we can do the same thing for L2. And um, then it's more experimental to verify that the reactive R also has reference thematics. So does reactive R have reference thematics? Yes, and that is what I try to confirm here. Yeah, L2 equals A. We get to know that, okay, for this reactive R, the first um, object has a value of one. And when we try to do the same thing for, for B, we will get to understand, okay, the second object has the value of, of 14. But what if we want to change? Okay, what if we want to change A1 to 20? So we'll just set the value. So let's see what it could be. Now it's 20. So to set it, that's what we need to set. That's how we can be able to set something interrupt and at your at your own um situation. So reactive expression recall that reactive reactive has two important properties it's lazy and it is hard. Lazy is hard we've talked about this in chapter where we talked about the fact that reactives make it so they don't um they don't recompute they store the previously run um run run um, solution in the memory and whenever they need to um, use it again, they just go back to the memory and pick it and use it again. So it's lazy and it is harsh. Um, and there are three important things that we have not yet covered. What you have expression do with the stores and why on the exit work inside of them. Now, this, are, this other part of reactive expression is supposed to be looking into now. Now, what is how those errors really work? Reactive expression also cast errors in exactly the same way they cast values. For example, take this reactive. So for this particular reactive now, it works just like it's, it would do for um, values. I think I have that somewhere. Yeah, so um when you run when when we run this because I I did the I did run them and I noticed that when this error comes, if we wait for like a second or two and we run it again, we get the same error. 
So it doesn't need to like be computed. It just picks the same. Um, just pick the same um, error, and it it does the same the same thing. So I even decided to wait for longer, see if I will get something totally like a different time. But I got the same. I, I got the same time. So errors are also treated the same as values when it comes to the reactive graph. Um, I. You have a reactor graph. Why? Okay, I'm going to move forward. Um, errors are treated the same as valid when it comes to the graph, and um, an error in an output is displayed in the graph. Um, only difference in what happens when an error in an output is observed is that an error in an output is displayed in the graph, and an error in an observer will cause the current system to terminate. But if we don't want that to happen, we could just wrap the code in try or try card. And this same system powers the require or rec function. And we saw a bit of that in section 8.12. And um, special error causes observers and output to stop what they are doing, but not otherwise fail. By default, it will cut output to the entire blank state. I think I, I wrote this out to see how this actually works out. Because I really wanted to understand what is going on at 2.1. Just hope I find how I suggest it. Somewhere to see what happened. So let's go back to eight point one two and see what really happened. We'll come back here. Eight point one. We have language. Yes. Yes. Using the computer. Um, what it does is it would um check for required values before aligning a reactive for user to consider. It checks for required values and once it checks, it would before okay you, you can continue and get the the result do i have that written somewhere i just need to find it i saw them oh. Is what I was running in. Um, okay, it's going on. Um, that's So um let's just go back to this. So what exactly is the local function do? Um like I said earlier, it's um it's possible for us to describe this one minute. Okay, so um, let's just go back here. Let's, 
Um, I'm sure that values are available before proceeding with the calculation or action. So the console output force, this is actually, if it is true, the output is being evaluated. The stop processing as usual, but instead of clearing the output, it's in whatever state it happens to be. So this actually is going to Okay, this special error because it's observed in output is stop for by default, the cost output is set to the initial blank state. But if you require a output to it, you have the current display. I remember, I know I tried this. I just don't know why I can't find um, where I did all of this earlier. Sorry, guys. I think we'll just move on. Um, Let's move on. I know how to find it. Um, you can use reactive as a short for, for function, the under exit function. How exactly does this, does this work? And this has just, um, how does this work? It allows you to run code when a reactive expression finishes, regardless of whether the reactive successfully returns an error or fits that error. And, um, Reactive actually is a sort of a function, automatically adding laziness and caching. And um, let's check this out. I think this would be easier. It, yes, this particular one, the on the exit and remove notification. When I ran this, what I noticed was um, I remember when we should this, it showed us um, the, um, the notification at the bottom of the at the right hand button of the of the screen. But when I ran this, uh, I noticed this didn't come up. It didn't show at all. And I it was because of this on exit uh, remote notification. And I tried um changing the duration to a hundred just to see what will happen. And I noticed that uh, I could see it for just like a second. It just goes off. Um I think on, on the exit actually makes it possible for, for this to happen that when you try running this, um, when you try running the, the the reactive, and the possibility would be okay. When you try running, if you need, okay, when you try running this, you guys know that the reactive is so for return. This will return an error of an error. It would um, run the code. So it's I think the best place if I just show what I did. If I went to run all of this and was trying to understand what really happened. To see what happens um, at the, when I run the app. So when I did it, stop run app. Wow. Okay, for this one thing I noticed when I used it, I observed the error was that it just was just the way variables will also work. Um, the same procedure, it's um, the active log showed us the last time. Uh, just the same way, if it, a, the, um, it moves from the, um, the 
the output to check the reactive expression then to the input. Same way it also move for errors. It goes in that same that same um pattern. Or so when it comes to when it is modified, I, I noticed that there were like um other set of um, other set of graphs underneath that were not validated, they were invalidated. And each time I click on the third button, it still keeps it, it, another one will be formed underneath. And it might take too long to, to, to run. Let me click push it, stop it, and run it again. If it works, fine. Going on. Go wrong. Okay. Wrong. Okay, so I don't know why this and there was always the error printed on the console side. Um, if anybody has an idea why this just um, I mean, okay, so <laughs> this doesn't take so long. This I think maybe I should restart R. Let me restart R, but I'll continue. Let's see what happens at the other end. Okay. So, um, Observers, observers and output. Observers and output are none of my active graphs. Now, um, they are eager and forgetful. Uh, that means they run based on what we went through in chapter, which is in chapter three, um, about observers. They pick the side effect. Like for example, let's say you want to debug, you would be able to get um you 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 use observers to debug and also for maybe um external things going on outside of the app. You want to, um um you're working with maybe external files or you want to, you want to yes, like you want to write the CSV file and, and the likes like that. And are powered by the same underlining to observe. So observers and output are powered by the same underlining to observe. Let's set up a block of code that is run every time one of the reactive values or expression is used. It, it's used, it's updated. Um, observers run immediately when you create them. Observers run immediately when you create them. And observers um, don't do something, they create something. Um, so when we do this, when we run this, the, the observe button actually would, uh, would give a message in the console. If it was to be in a, in a tiny app, we would only get this information in the console. And 
according to what that you want said, I rarely use observe in this book, but the low level tool that powers the user to plainly observe events. And um, while I was going through this book, I realized that observe and observe event are different by I add an isolate function. If I have to um, use the observe function to, to um, say, uh, validate, check a code that would later end in an infinity, I will not get into the my console. But if I isolate that part, the uh, I think it's called the, the handler expression. If I isolate that part, I would be able to get. Uh, So I'll get that part and I would be able to get the results. So it's like, um, so I need to like pull out this, um, out this, uh, the hundred expression from being reactive, like going back to pick the answer and keep printing. If we look at this, uh, this, yeah, we notice that this observe button would print this in the console. So each time, um, you, um, check. Set a reactive value, it would print it a number of times. Like this time it's printing it twice, and at this point it's printing it twice. And um, it prints the sources the observer to be triggered. The observer itself, observe, setting up another observer. So each time it changes, it gets another observer, so it's really printed another time. Um, as you know, the author mentioned that you should not, um, you should not. Um, have a nested observers together and you cannot create an observer inside output. If, if there will be a case for that, you have to just um, sketch out the reactive graph and check what, and most times it should be at the top of the uh, code. Um, isolating code, uh, I think I mentioned about this before coming in. I think that I'll, I'll talk about two important tools for controlling exactly how and when the reactive graph is invalidated. The first section will discuss isolated the function. The two that powers observe event and event reactive. So, it is able to, to uh, manage the situation of the possibility of an infinite loop from the um, sorry, the, let me just do this now. I don't want to call the wrong thing because I know it takes two arguments. Observe takes two arguments. One is the um, the two expressions. I think one is the under expression and the other is the Um, if an expression, then also back to this observing of some events. So, um The observed event is equivalent to an observed that has the isolate function, um, the isolate function, that has the isolate function also. It doesn't really decouples what you want to do into from what action you want to do. And it actually performs the analogous work for reactive. Um, observed event and event reactive. Event reactive works for reactive, but observed event works for the observed, like it adds the isolate function. For both of them, but on different um, for different use. And what exactly is the similarity? Both functions will ignore any event that you ignore, or in special case, the back number zero. And um, both 
by default, both functions will run once when you create them. For that event only, you can use once equal to run the handler only once. And um, okay, uh, I will. Okay. Uh, com complete the R below the R function that updates out and the value X only when the button is pressed. So, um, is my I guess my RS my R studio I think should work this time. Yes, it's running now. Can you see it? We're supposed to see your art studio or the browser? Oh, the art studio. No, I see um, a shiny app in the browser. Okay, okay, okay. So, yes, so this is the. This is the output. The shiny app for this um, exercise there, and and so when I possible, let me just do this and click on the capture. We have this picture out here. But what happens to the what happens in the what happens? Um, complete the blue with the cover function that updates out to the value of X only when the button is pressed. Okay, so let me share this. So, share. This. Okay. okay, so um, this is it. I think can you see my can you see my you now? Yeah, I can see the I can see our studio and the browser. Okay, good. So if I run this, I would get the app, and whenever I click on on the capture, it automatically updates this uh, update out. And I used this uh, the event reactive makes it possible for us to get this printed underneath. So we get to see okay um, the. Where I understood from this was that each time we use either the observe event or the event reactive, we're able to know exactly what's going on. If something goes wrong in maybe the input, uh, the the um, the input, we'll be able to like find out exactly where did this thing go wrong. Because if I don't get if this part of the code doesn't run back, I don't get any um if I don't get Anything back? The, let me look for this other, uh, the other one that has to do with the event. If I don't get anything back, and I know something is wrong, if I don't get anything back on the console, I know something is wrong, and I need to like check the the input and know exactly okay where is this where is this coming from? What really went wrong? So what I personally got, what I personally took from it, is to this point where you have these observe event. Whatever is at the other side of this of the code. Whoever is at the other side of the part of the code, when this runs, after this is event reactive, it's almost um, written in the same format. So after this curly braces, whatever runs here, if it's green, if you see it in your console, then it's like, okay, you know exactly this is what is happening or this is what didn't happen, right? So you could, like check it and know what to do, to do about it. Um, Sorry guys, I know I did think the way I so um for time the validation we have the isolate function. We talked uh, a lot about the isolate function its importance and how it can save uh, an observe and a code between the observe function that is running in that we don't get to see anything running in the console. And interestingly. I have examples for all of this because I ran all of this and I saw these things happen 
and shook me. I can just leave my hands on them right now. I don't know why, and it's not just running where I want it to. No. But let's just go to this, the next part. Okay, so um, I think we just find the graphic that is in my data set. But for everybody, they have put the opposite. I don't think this time, but they always tell us exactly the, the inner work for most of these functions. Like, um, they told us why observe events work the way it does. They told us about the power of the isolate function and how we like empower the empower the observe function to act just like the um, observe events. But this time around, they're talking about the validation of the function. Um, how it involves the reactive channel function. It's like how it, how like reactive channel function was almost the same thing, but the underlining to that causes it is this particular function invalidate data. And um, how does the system invalidate data work? Of course, any reactive function must be invalidated after um, any second. It's useful for creating an animation. For example, let's say we are to run a simulation and um, we use a shiny app without using this function. It will just keep running as fast as, as possible. And we don't get to really see the time relation in place. So but whenever we impute this function, it makes it possible for us to we get to see um get to see this roll out. Okay. Uh, okay, okay. Come on, Lydia. Okay. Okay, Lydia. Yes, okay, so um, that's what the invalidate data function does. Um, and this observer, we increment a cumulative sum with a random number. So if you use this observer, it will um, increment a cumulative sum with a random number. And in the process, we can invalidate that later in 300, 300 milliseconds. And from there, we get and from there we get an output that makes that kind of possible. Um, so at this point, there's another subsection on pooling. This question of invalid data is the connection to data that's changing outside of R. And for this, we I got to do we introduce another function, reactive pool, and um, how it actually works because using the um the invalid the invalidate data. Um, this is a problem, and what exactly is this problem? Um, you have to use this. You connect changing data into China reactive graph, where well, it has a serious downside. And when you invalidate the reactive, you also invalidate all downstream. So even if the data is the same, all the downstream work has to be redone. However, this problem can provide reactive pool. It takes two functions one that are from creativity. And check to see if the data has changed, and another that perform an intelligent function that actually does the computation. So we actually pull actually makes this, this possible. And the other functions written here are put there to um return the last time the file was modified and the other to read the file itself. So um long running reactive. If you're performing a long running computation, there's an important question. So at this point. We we have some we have some uh, examples here that shows how um, on the exits added to an invalidate data can make it possible for also have force um, to escape the situation of an infinite uh, so when we have on the exit function including the invalidate data. The, it takes us from this issue in terms of um, so even really actually like it's, it's quick invalidation. It's, it's time, but when we have on the exit, it, it, it makes it possible for us to have it done at a certain. Um, makes it possible for us to escape the possibility of an of an infinite 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 cube. Time as accuracy, um, we talked about we put a bit on this. I think I think, um, I think in chapter eight, a bit of this in chapter eight, but um, the number of milliseconds specified in the new data is a polite request, not a demand. So, okay, 
how does this work? For example, we have an app that is running and we impute a certain in like 300 milliseconds. It's, the app will not, that's just like the minimum time. It won't, it won't actually be exactly at that time because if there are other errors underneath that have to, that have to, um, a tool on the app that would take its own time before they, they get um, they get run. This time they would take will add on to that 300 milliseconds before you get the the, um, the app to do what you um, you actually want to. I think that what this aspect is about, and that's mostly everything here. Yeah, uh, guys, um, I don't know what happened to my field. Just in allow stream or something like to show. Uh, so guys, uh, I, I think um code two really had uh, had guys really talk about this this type of in depth and use case where they had to use most of this function. Let me go back to code two and check um with the big and see what really happened. Right. Um, uh, this presentation, I don't know what happened. It's just quite planned. It's so much for your time. Um, chapter 15. Anyone have anything? I don't have anything. Uh, Kevin, uh, you're taking chapter 16, right? Um, yes, next week. Yeah, it seems like the the, the most of the, the remaining seems a bit, uh, a bit um, in depth, like the concept are a bit in depth and it takes me more time to like go through them to really understand them. I don't know how that will be. And um, you'll be taking chapter 16 next week. You'll be available, right? Um, come again. You'll be available to take chapter 16 next week, right? Will you be available to take chapter 16 next week, Trevin? Hello? I'm good with whatever we do. Okay, no, I was just asking if you'll be available. Like, uh, yeah, see. yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Um, uh, with this, uh, done. Um, thank you guys for coming around. Um, have a great day. Thank you, Matthew.